Greetings, I'm Dr. David Walton, Assistant Professor of History and Coordinator of the African American Studies Minor here at the University of North Carolina at Pembroke. And joining us today is distinguished scholar, Dr. Michael Eric Dyson, author, academic, political, cultural analyst, and fellow Detroit native. Greetings, Dr. Dyson. Good to meet you uh, again, Dr. Walden. Good to see you, my friend. Yes, sir. I hope your trip and your travel was safe and enjoyable. Yes, sir. Very much awesome, so. Awesome. Awesome. Right. Now, the first question I want to ask, in the age of YouTube scholars mm -hmm. and so-called YouTube, sco YouTube scholarship, mm -hmm. what can black professors, professors of black studies, professors of black history do to get our message out, to get our uh, lectures out that are rooted in actual scholarship and academic training to the masses? Yeah, that's a great point. Um, look, let's first of all accentuate, highlight, and underscore the positive value of social media. You know, um, you can send someone an article mm -hmm. uh, in an archive that used to take you a long time, shoe leather and space and time to go to the library. Yes, sir. That's why I call it, you know, when the kids say the library, that's where the lies are buried. You got to go dig them up. Indeed. So you pull the card catalog out, look through it, 108.76, that ain't no uh, radio station dial number for the latest jams. Mm. That was social theory or political theory and get a book and then, or look in the card catalog or the periodical uh, guide for literature and magazines. Now, you know, Dr. Walden can send it to Michael Eric Dyson, boom, in a second, and you've got it archived. That's brilliant, that's beautiful. Indeed. It condenses space. You can put an entire library at the disposal of somebody's keystrokes or fingertips. That's beautiful. The problem is, and you can democratize the expression of public scholarship. People can mm -hmm. weigh in. You ain't got to have a PhD or a JD or a, another letter behind your name. If you're highly intelligent and say something that somebody picks up on, it can go viral. That's all good. But let's be real, too. It's a lot of craziness out of here, too. <laughs> Indeed. A lot of schlock out here. Yes, sir. Everybody think because you got a platform, you got something to say. Yes, Just because you got a platform don't mean you deserve it. Mm -hmm. Don't mean you, you know, that you have some highly intelligent, skillful thing to say. Yeah. So people think they can shoot back at you and talk trash. I'm 20 bucks in the game, homie. What you got? Mm -hmm. So the reality is it doesn't mean that we legitimate and validate um, a particular point of view because a person has accumulated a scholarship versus somebody who could be highly intelligent who doesn't. But we can't disrespect the process of accumulating the wealth of knowledge and insight that one might want to pass on. Indeed. So I think what, um, to answer your question more directly, I think we got to become more savvy about the tech world and mm -hmm. figure out how to get our lectures out there, Indeed. to do those series where they have famous professors, get some famous black professors of Africana studies or African American studies or you know, the transatlantic black studies and get our stuff out there, figure out ways to not be allergic to the public. And you know, Amen. old school scholars were like, oh my God, you know, that public scholarship, that's crazy, or you're on TV, mm. or you're doing pop cultural stuff, ah, by humbug. Indeed. Well, Indeed. the thing is, you gotta learn how to get your stuff out there mm. and say it in such a fashion that the masses can consume it and then as a result of that, the wealth of knowledge that we possess, the, the vast understanding that uh, scholars who may not ordinarily get a kind of hearing in the public mm. can now begin to express themselves through is extremely important. Yeah, I certainly agree. And, and both of us coming from Detroit, we right. come from a tradition of that type of community and intellectual, black intellectual interaction. That's exactly right. I, I, so I think we're more predisposed to that than maybe people from different eras and, and areas they might be foreign to that. That's right, that's yeah. right. No, that's a great point. Uh, you know, we, look, my father was part of UAW, United Auto Workers. I was too, wasn't no summer job, I was doing it for real. Mm -hmm. And, mm -hmm. but there are people like Kenneth Cockrell, yes. great leader, uh, lawyer, who had he not died uh, prematurely at 50, 51, probably would have been the mayor of Detroit. Yes. Um, you know, these activists, uh, you know, who were out there, Grace Lee Boggs before yes. her, and with her husband, James Boggs. I mean, they were given a serious insight, uh, mm -hmm. the pedagogy of the oppressed. Yes. Um, and speaking to us in terms we could understand, encouraging us to listen to and learn from progressive thinkers. And that was part and parcel of what we are. That was in the womb for yes, us sir. to absorb. Yes, and sir. I'm so glad we came from that uh, tremendous and unapologetically 
progressive and uh, forward-looking uh, mm -hmm. agenda and generation of people. Indeed, indeed. Now, I, I have a follow-up question. Mm -hmm. In the era now where me, more young people, mm -hmm. for example, my niece asked me to get her some books on traditional African knowledge systems, African mm -hmm. spirituality. Right. As more young people are more interested in that, mm -hmm. uh, with the help of maybe some celebrities like uh, Beyonce, Nose Carter, mm -hmm. who openly practice, Orisha and Oshun, mm -hmm. uh, do you think that that awakening of African spirituality uh, can pose a threat or maybe reshape uh, the tradition of black liberation theology? No, it's a great question too. Uh, look, it can be an adjunct to and commensurate with mm -hmm. and going along with. It doesn't have to be this versus that. Indeed. You can do them both. I know, you know, some old school fundamentalists might, oh my God, if it's not <laughs> Jesus and him crucified, get out my face. Yes. <laughs> you know, uh, <laughs> you can tell I ain't no uh, regular Baptist preacher. <laughs> so I'm a, I'm a kind of, uh, you know, different kind of yes. preacher. I saw so you I think on books, TV. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so we should be open to all kinds of spiritual traditions. Indeed, indeed. You know, African Orisha, mm -hmm. you know, Eshu Alegba. Mm -hmm. If you talk about what happens with Condomble across the diaspora, you know, there are many and varied, you know, African or, you know, African spiritual traditions that are extremely important and valuable to nurturing the sense of spiritual self-reflection and critical evaluation of the world that black people have. I don't see it as a challenge to, except a challenge to some of the more narrow doctrinaire points that black religious viewpoints can put forth. For instance, you know, uh, when you go to traditional black churches, women have a regimented, rigid place. Gay, lesbian bodies are kind of marginalized, even though they're central. They're in the choir, everybody mm -hmm. know. Yeah, you know, everybody yeah. know. Yeah. Directing the choir, everybody yes, know. Yes, sir. But, you know, people trying to still be homophobic, it don't make no mm -hmm. sense. Why mm -hmm. are you being homophobic and, and you got the man or woman singing behind you or on the usher board, or on the deacon board, or quite mm -hmm. as it's kept in the pulpit. Indeed. You know, uh, had, like my frat brother, Bishop Eddie Long. No doubt. You Indeed. know, you got queer sexuality and yeah. so on, and we should embrace people wholly and fully, and hopefully some of those African religious traditions and spiritual practices can tutor us in a tolerance for and an appreciation of all ranges of blackness, and that's a, a beautiful thing. Awesome. Awesome. Now back home, in our home, mm -hmm. my mom's from the east side. Right. She dropped out of Finney to get married. Mm -hmm. uh, she's around with Cockrell and them, uh, mm -hmm. BSUF, Black Student United Front. Right, right. And my dad, the union man, some experience with the League of Revolutionary Black Workers. Mm -hmm. Now I go back to some of them neighborhoods uh, beyond just downtown and parts of the west side, but even the east side, and I see this gentrification. Yeah. My dad worked at Cass Corridor, and I would go visit him at his job in high school, and you know, I would see uh, crack vials, mm -hmm. used condoms, all stuff in the corridor, right? Because mm -hmm. he worked at Cast Tech, I should say. Uh, now I go there and I took my ex-wife there and we were going to the masjid near there, and I couldn't even find a piece of trash on the ground. Now yeah. I pose that to say, uh, in this era of gentrification, uh, should black communities maybe reconsider W.E.B. Du Bois' notion of self-segregation, or what are some uh, strategies that we might think of to, you know, make gentrification not destroy our communities. Right, brilliant. Uh, first of all, kudos to you for being civil enough to take your ex-wife there. You're a good man. <laughs> uh, <laughs> for sure. Uh, <laughs> but yeah, that's a that's a great point. But gentrification is is astonishing. You got Brother Dan Gilbert, a yes. good man in many ways. But being like the second or third biggest land over, landowner in the state, mm -hmm. like over a hundred and some odd buildings with his own arguably police force that's mm -hmm. privatized. Mm -hmm. You know, black people used to be pushed into the inner city, the deindustrialized or post-industrial urban center mm -hmm. where transportation networks went out to the suburbs where we couldn't get to. Indeed. Um, the jobs are out there. Mm -hmm. So now, those who are in the suburbs and exurbs are coming back to re-territorialize mm -hmm. uh, post-industrial, de-industrialized urban spaces. Mm -hmm. The demographics have shifted. Mm -hmm. The marginal, economically speaking, people who could barely hold on now get pushed out because when gentrification comes and white folk come back into the city, it raises the prices of their rent. Yes, sir. That's why black people are always on a government shutdown, mm -hmm. always without resources that we should have, Indeed. always against the odds do we make what we make. 
And so um, as, as much as I can celebrate the fact that the streets are clean and they know crack vials and it's cleaned up, it's cleaned up for who? The white people. It's cleaned up for people who are coming back mm. and who need protection. Now, yes. I ain't mad at them for doing that, but we mm. should have that as well. Indeed. And so I think gentrification of that sort has been deeply and profoundly problematic. Mm. And we got to figure out ways to address the needs of those who are already there before the gentrifiers come and how do we take care of their needs and address their particular issues uh, without stopping the flow, inevitably speaking, of you know, gentrifying presences where people come back in to occupy homes you know, at a, gr a great discount, Indeed. at a great rate, but then those who are there can't even afford to hold on to their own homes because the property values all of a sudden shoot up. And they can't even enjoy the elevated education that will come as a result of the increased tax base. So it's wrong on so many levels. Indeed. And it's really disturbing to me to see black and brown people and, you know, native peoples, people of color who are pushed to the margins, mm -hmm. who are not allowed to enjoy, um, you know, the overflow of the coffers now that people decide to come back to the city. Indeed, indeed. Great answer. And, mm -hmm. you. Uh, you know, I think about that and talk about that a lot back home with folks. Mm -hmm. And some, a question they pose to me sometimes, mm -hmm. uh, and so I'll pose it to you. Uh, when we think about gentrification, we usually view it through a racialized lens, right? Mm -hmm. Now, um, would Af uh, college graduate uh, affluent African Americans who aren't from this commu that community who sure. moved there, would that be considered gentrification? I ask because sure. I'm part of the reverse migration, obviously. Right, right. And I have graduate degrees, nice salary, not the greatest, but it's good enough for me right now. Right. Right. And I come and move to this community uh, here where there's a lot of economic struggles, so I mm -hmm. could be perceived as <clears throat> sure. a gentrifier, but someone say you're not because you're black. And I'm like, I don't know if it's... Right. You know, so I'm curious your thoughts. No, right. You know, you, you're talking about race and class. You yeah, know, indeed. we mentioned Du Bois. I should uh, be more explicit about him uh, in terms of self-segregation. I want to answer that part. You know, when you think about, you know, the fact that many black communities want to be together. So that self-segregation is extremely important. You know, a lot of white people say, well, what's the difference between self-segregation and imposed segregation? Mm -hmm. A world of difference. Indeed. Because when you choose to get together yourself, that's different than you being forced. Mm -hmm. uh, to be together. So self-segregation's purpose is to forge an alliance and create resource-based commonality so that black people can leverage our common interests um, in defense of our burgeoning economic status or the educational status we want to solidify and get our kids into better schools or to just be able to, you know, enjoy a space that is not, you know, invaded by people who might be hostile Mm -hmm. to your mm -hmm. own identity or to your own culture. Mm -hmm. Now, yeah, of course, black people, you know, used to call them buppies. Yes, sir. You know, <laughs> yes, black sir. urban professionals who are coming into as yuppies, young urban mm -hmm. professionals. But the black guy, of course, that's gentrification. You can mm -hmm. come in into a neighborhood where if, if poor black people get pushed out, if working class people get pushed out, just because you black don't mean they ain't getting pushed out. Indeed. Did they really? I mean, right. So it's good. But now I'm being replaced by an upwardly mobile black person who doesn't really concern him or herself with my condition. I don't mm -hmm. think they care. He's still getting <laughs> jacked up. Indeed. Right? Indeed. Yes, so sir. in that sense, uh, it is true. On the other hand, if, um, if the case is that people like you reverse migration, come back south, reverse uh, you know, uh, immigration, so to speak, into these arenas and territories, and you bring in knowledge, that's extremely important. If you bring in resources to the community, that's extremely important, intellectually, socially, spiritually, culturally. That's important because what happened in our own black communities where we had self-segregation before, well, really, it was imposed segregation during Jim Crow. Black folk couldn't live in other places. That was, in one sense, that was beautiful because all of us had to live together. The butcher, the lawyer, the candlestick maker, the engineer, Indeed. the professor, you know, the would-be hood, all together. Mm -hmm. in the same uh in the same general area yes, so we saw each other and mm -hmm. a person trying to get up out of there could see what the results were of a doctor or a lawyer or a philosopher because they would see him in the neighborhood yes sir how you doing mr ropeson fine how you doing sir fine how you doing madam you know nanny helen burrows or mm -hmm. you know mary mcleod bethune so if you could see them in the neighborhood if you could see them in the broader community you know, what you want it to be. Now you could see it, you could be it, right? Mm -hmm. Whereas with 
you know, desegregation and white flight and black track to the suburbs and the brain drain from our black institutions and the mm -hmm. like, then it's difficult, more mm -hmm. difficult Indeed. for young people to see something of importance and value in the work that is being done that they might be able to achieve if they could ever see it. So if a person like you comes back to the hood or to the neighborhood and you bring those kind of resources and insight and intelligence and uh, accessibility to you, that's a good thing. Indeed. I mm -hmm. appreciate that. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Now, uh, Considering the future of black studies, uh, if you had to point to two things that you would like to see uh, black studies take a turn towards or new trends, new directions mm -hmm. in black studies, what would they be? Yeah, that's a, gr that's a great point. I think, uh, you know, intergenerational analyses, because, mm -hmm. uh, you know, there's a lot of tension. I, p I posted the other day on Instagram about cancel culture. Mm -hmm. Got a lot of young people coming at me. <laughs> you know, I defend young people. I love them. But I just think there's something problematic about, you know, cancel somebody, you know. Mm -hmm. Now, I'm sure they try to tell me I'm just old. That's just, you know, that's just their way of saying when you say, you didn't mean it literally when you said we killing stuff. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but when you say we killing it, that's different than I'm canceling you. Yeah. You know, Walton is canceled. Dyson is canceled. Because you disagree with me? You're just going to cancel somebody? Mm -hmm. And even people that you find morally reprehensible, you know, um, we all have a path toward evolution. I'm not saying we shouldn't distance ourselves from mm -hmm. them, hold them accountable. You know, if they got to go to jail, that too. But canceling another human being is problematic to me. Maybe I am old. Maybe mm -hmm. I just don't get the lingo. But I think it's important for us to do these kind of intergenerational studies where we see trends of convergence and differentiation, you know, generationally. Or we see it's not just generation, it's genre. Because mm -hmm. you might be a black nationalist 50 years ago and you could be a black nationalist now. Or an integrationist then and an integrationist now. Mm -hmm. Or somebody who's open to dialogue you know, and who's less acerbic and less belligerent than others might be. Mm -hmm. So I would love to see that taken up. And I think, uh, you know, other abilities, disability studies within African-American culture awesome. to talk about the ways in which those who are marginal because of their own other abilities, mm -hmm. disabilities, mm -hmm. uh, are populated <laughs> within African-American culture and mm -hmm. are hardly uh, talked about uh, as well. So those are a couple, along with continuing issues of gender and yes. queer studies, those things are extremely yes. important for us as well. Yes, I, I certainly agree. And what I've noticed, because I'm a member of ASILA and NCBS, mm -hmm. and I'm one of the few folk who actually bring undergraduate students mm -hmm. to those conferences. Mm -hmm. uh, and what I'm seeing in black studies, unfortunately, is what I see in, in a lot of, uh, even in the modern civil rights movement, mm -hmm. is uh, the old guard won't give the young guard an opportunity to step up. You right, know? Right. I remember, I'm not gonna say any names, but I was at, on a panel as a young boy, you know, uh, and we represented the future in the next 50 years mm -hmm. of black studies, right? And, uh, and a pioneer and elder came and got mad because he felt we didn't cite him enough in our work. Mm. Now first, I do black power studies. Mm. My dissertation is about to be the Black Student United Front, right. the League of Revolutionary Black Workers, mm. as well as SASO in South Africa. I'm, so it, it, why, it, it wouldn't be appropriate. Right, but right, just right. the anger yeah. that I felt in his heart that was being, and you know, so I, that just bothered, and I just wanted to mention that. Yeah, I don't, well, you know, people get bitter, man, look. Yeah. They get bitter when they're not recognized. They get bitter yeah. when they think they've been overlooked. Yeah. So on the one hand, you try to be empathetic and understand, like, bless your heart, you didn't get it, but dog, don't be spitting on me. Indeed. You know, don't spit Indeed. the venom at me because I'm out here trying to extend and, you know, expand mm -hmm. the consciousness and extend mm -hmm. the trajectory of black studies and what we're able to do and how we're able to think about it. And mm -hmm. as a young person, we should create space. That's why I've tried to, throughout my career, create enormous space for young people Indeed. so that they can thrive and then even study, you know, youth culture. Yes, and I'm sir. trying to, you know, I'm trying to figure out this mumble rap. <laughs> oh, you and me both, my students will tell you, every Tuesdays and Thursday, I'll spend at least 30 seconds with confusion over mumble rap. <laughs> 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 exactly. See, it's not just me, students, <laughs> see, see. <laughs> now, I love it, I mean, because yeah. I think the mumble rap is about cadence. Maybe if, Indeed. if, Indeed. if people had taken note of what we were saying when, when young people were saying it clearly mm -hmm. and hadn't still dissed us, they wouldn't have to go to an alternative route. Yeah. Like swing music is in because it's being overtaken by white musicians, then bebop comes along from the streets. Yes, sir. Charlie Parker, mm -hmm. Miles Davis, right? They, they're doing bebop from the street as a rebellion stylistically against the appropriation 
of their musical varieties by dominant white culture. Yeah. Mumble rap is a kind of rebellion against that as well. Plus it's an emphasis on cadence Indeed. and flow more than lyrics. So mm -hmm. I'm joking with him, but at the same time, you know what I'm saying? No, no, really, I do not know what you're saying. <laughs> but, uh, but no, it's all important. And it's Indeed. important for us to create space for young people yeah. like yourself, young scholars coming along who challenge us, who make us think, who make us grow who make us reconsider what we thought we knew. Mm -hmm. And then in the turn at the same time, you know, a learn and appreciate from some older people as well. You know, I, I think about the Super Bowl, a 41 year old guy named Tom Brady is up there competing against young cats, man. Indeed. You know, uh, so the thing is, you got to create space for younger people, but sometimes older people can do their thing too. Indeed. So we got to have a both and, Indeed. not an either or, but we need brilliant young people like yourself coming in. Now, I will say this, for some young people, they just think that they just gonna, it's going to be giving it to them because they're there. Mm -hmm. Bro, what you doing with it? You got to use, you know, when I was coming up, you coming up, and you're much younger than me, you know, I was carrying Jesse Jackson's bags. Mm -hmm. I had a PhD from Princeton, but that was the job. I understood it because I was, I was you know, in one sense, uh, working with him, learning from him. Um, you know, and, and scholars that were my senior, I wanted to absorb their knowledge. And I had to earn my way there. I couldn't just do it because I'm young mm -hmm. and I'm here. You got, to, you got to fight for your way to get in because when you fight for it, then you have an appreciation for what your skills are and people that you've, you know, contested and competed with in a good sense, not a negative sense, Indeed. you know, began to appreciate your value. So it can't just be because I'm here, open the door. Mm -hmm. No, you got to open the door, you know, yeah. yourself. Knock it down. Don't ask nobody for permission. Do what you got to do. That's right. Be who you are. That's and right. then your gift, as the Bible says in Proverbs, will make a way for itself. Mm -hmm. And I think that's equally important as well. Awesome. Awesome. Mm -hmm. Awesome. Uh, I want to ask one last question and mm -hmm. then have you uh, tell us about your new book project. Okay. Mm -hmm. uh, but my question is, I'm like the number one Tupac, Amaru, Shakur, mm -hmm. Machiavelli, the Don fan. <laughs> so you can only imagine how excited I was when I got that call that I was getting this job here. Yes, sir. I just, the sad part about it, it was just a year after she passed, so I never mm -hmm. got a chance to meet her. Right. Uh, but nonetheless, uh, what was that experience like doing research and writing a book with such a powerful but yet controversial figure? Yeah, well, you know, Afeni Shakur, uh, the mother of uh, Tupac Shakur uh, was an extraordinary woman herself. The, Part yes, of the, sir. you know, New York 21, the Black Panthers. Um, Tupac said he was literally born in jail because, you know, he was in his mother's womb mm -hmm. when she was arrested on uh, trumped up charges in uh, New York. But writing about Tupac was extraordinary, man, because one of the great rhetorical geniuses. I'm glad young people still know him, although I, I think more people should know him. Indeed. You know, I saw somebody diss him like, oh, I'm better than Tupac. Slow down with that, bro. <laughs> Just like they said, they were better than Biggie. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Slow down now. Mm -hmm. Slow down, Mace, you're killing them. <laughs> so, you know, when you listen to a Tupac now, yeah. you know, Tupac and Biggie, I wish they could have lived so that they yes. could have, I think they would have gotten together I agree. beyond that beef. Mm -hmm. I mean, Biggie's flow was incredible mm -hmm. as, um, you know, most deaf told me, but then known as most deaf now, Yasin Bey, uh, said he was the mathematician of flow. Mm -hmm. You know, B I G P O P P A, no info for the D E A, metal federal agents, mad because I'm flagrant, tap my cell, land the phone in the basement. Mm -hmm. You know, very precise. Yeah. Tupac was about vision. Mm -hmm. You know, somebody wake me, I'm dreaming. Indeed. I started as a seed, the semen, swimming upstream, planted in the womb while screaming. On the top was my pops, my mama hollering, stop from a single drop. This is what they got. So he was self-reflective. He was emotional way before Drake. Mm -hmm. You know, mm -hmm. Drake. Okay. <laughs> 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 Wait a minute. Soldier Boy got that tech money, though. Soldier Boy is yeah. forging alliances with mm -hmm. uh, others and bringing hip hop into the tech world. But so and I love, I'm a number one Drake fan, too. Mm -hmm. So. So before Drake exposed himself, his emotional intensity, the internal agenda of his own desire, you know, Tupac was expressing that yes. as yes. well. So an incredible genius. He'd be, he could be political one hand mm -hmm. and then much respect to those who break their neck to keep the right eyes. Yeah, they will spread a brother majorly. Mm -hmm. And I don't know why your girl keeps paging me. He could go from partying yes. to getting around 
to Brenda's got a baby Indeed. to, um, you know, keep your head up. Yes, sir. Um, so it's an extraordinary figure. Or he could talk about police brutality. Just the other day, I got lynched by some crooked cops. Mm -hmm. And to this day, them same cops on the beat getting major pay. Mm -hmm. But when I get my check, they taking tax out. So we paying the cops to knock the blacks out. Yes, sir. So Pac was, was an extraordinary figure, man. And uh, doing research on him just confirmed for me how remarkable he was and remains. And the reason he still is so relevant is because he spoke to his time with poignancy, with insight, with uh, tremendous verve and vigor. And he worked hard and he was political mm. and he loved black people without apology. So he remains evergreen in his appeal. Awesome. That was a great answer. Mm -hmm. And Thank then lastly, sir. to wrap up, just a quick, maybe 60 seconds, mm -hmm. uh, tell the audience mm -hmm. and hopefully my students uh, about your new, your most recent project. Right. Um, well, I wrote a book, Tears We Cannot Stop, A Sermon to White America. Then after that, within the next year, I wrote a book um, about James Baldwin. It, it, you know, it's called What True Sounds Like. Robert F. Kennedy, James Baldwin, and our unfinished conversation on race. And it was about a big meeting between Robert F. Kennedy, who was then the Attorney General, and James Baldwin, the great writer. And he brought, he, you know, Kennedy said, bring along some of your friends. Mm -hmm. Well, when you're Baldwin, your friends are Harry Belafonte, <laughs> yeah. Lena Horne, uh, Lorraine Hansberry, all tremendous black artists. And they had a set to, they had a fight, they had a disagreement. And then they wore Robert Kennedy out. He thought they were going to be grateful to be there. They said, we ain't grateful. We bring in the noise and the fire. Mm -hmm. They did so. Kennedy got mad, sick the FBI on him, calmed down, took their uh, criticism to heart, began to speak really about race. And for the rest of his life, until he died in, from assassination, you know, in Assassin's Bullets in 1968, he was deeply and profoundly concerned about race. And Baldwin and his group uh, had a tremendous imp ap impact on uh, Robert Kennedy. And that meeting was uh, extremely important. Awesome. Well, thank you, Dr. Dyson, thank for coming. Thank you, Dr. Walton. Appreciate it's a pleasure you, man. To have Detroit, you. Detroit stand up. Yes, Love D that. Town, 313. What it is, the yes, D. Yes, what yes. up, though? Yeah, that's it. <laughs> I, I should have had some buffs on. <laughs> <laughs> my Detroit hat, what yeah, up? Yeah. With some Gators, pink Gators, <laughs> my Detroit players. Yeah, indeed, that's what Biggie indeed. said. Uh -huh. Well, uh, thank you for joining us, and please tune in next time. And once again, we are changing lives through education at University of North Carolina at Pembroke.